Good evening. I'm Mark Updegrove, the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. Welcome to the fourth of six sessions on the path to racial equity. As those of you who have attended previous sessions know, the concept for this series came when Leslie Wingo, the president and CEO of Sanders Wingo, and I met about a year ago. Our friendship began as we talked about the issue of racial equity. Those conversations developed into further discussions around ways that we could all engage the community in working to create positive change toward greater equality. We found ourselves asking, what practical, simple steps can we all take toward greater racial understanding and equality? Though we certainly didn't have all the answers, we knew people and organizations who did. And that led to the path to racial equity, an unprecedented partnership of over 20 lo local nonprofit organizations exploring different aspects of racial equity. Leslie and I are grateful to our partners for coming together to make this happen. We're also grateful to tonight's guests, Tam Hawkins, the president and CEO of the Greater Austin Black Chamber of Commerce, and our moderator, Renee LaFaire, the regional director of the Anti-Defamation League in Austin. You'll be in very good hands as they explore economic equity, what we can all do to bridge the wealth gap and create long-term opportunity for people of color. So now without further ado, it is my great honor uh, to introduce Tam Hawkins and Renee LaFaire. Hello, my name is Renee LaFaire and I'm the regional director of ADL Austin. Tonight, I am thrilled to speak with Tam Hawkins. Tam is the CEO of the Greater Austin Black Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Tam. I'm excited to be here with you to hear your wisdom and thoughts. During our discussion today, we are going to talk about three ways that we can all work towards economic justice. Economic justice is such a huge issue. It encompasses redlining, education, job training, decriminalization. It threads itself across all sectors. First, Tam, can you explain what economic justice means and how we got where we are today? Oh, Renee, I, I wish I had uh, the magic crystal ball to go back in time. Um, I often think about this and, and wonder how did all of this happen? But I can give you my point of view from where I sit uh, as the CEO of the, the Austin Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, economic justice is making certain that opportunities economically are, are open to all. It's basically making certain that things are fair and that everybody, regardless of their skin color, uh, have access to uh, intergenerational wealth, have access to things that that not, that aren't even that lofty, but things that are just simple as, you know, affordable housing. Um, making certain that all all communities, in particular uh, communities of colors, that have have not seen uh, their fair share of equity and and the economic uh, dream. That's the American dream. So for me, like as I've been kind of studying this issue over the last few years, I guess you could say that my aha moment was understanding redlining and understanding that people could not get mortgages. And how do you build wealth if you don't have the opportunity to buy a home? And further, like the GI Bill, the GI Bill was supposed to help people buy homes, but a lot of banks wouldn't lend to people of color and or there were covenants against it in certain neighborhoods. So what happens over generations? How, how, how does that lead to where we are right now? So I think we even need to go back a little bit more, right? Because we, you think of the, the, the average African-American in this country that has roots in this country start, most likely has some history with slavery, their family. Not, a, not everybody, but the majority. So you compact that with not being able to create wealth for generations for hundreds of years, and then you move on to different legislation like Jim Crow, and then you get into redlining and um, and other um, laws that even currently prevent, and I don't know, I, I guess I misspoke there. It was not laws, but other uh, systems that continue to pre perpetuate a compounded uh, economic uh, instability. And so I, I believe that the effect is that you can't 
uh, have the funds that you need to start a new business. You don't have the funds to send your, your children to college or you don't have the ability to have some of the, the freedoms that others might take for granted. Um, and rightfully so, like everyone deserves that um, part of that dream again. So why, why is this so hard to change? I mean, like you're, you're CEO of, of the chamber. I mean, so for example, in your world of, of black owned businesses, right? What is it that makes black, what are the, what are the specific differences that you see in black owned businesses versus other businesses? You know, are there specific challenges? So I think one that we all think of uh, America as a meritocracy. So we all like, we all believe in it that you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, the strongest survive. And, and to some degree, some of that is accurate, right? But then when you have systems that we all inherited, quite frankly, so nobody really is necessarily responsible for cr the creation of the systems that we live in, but we're all responsible for dismantling some of the injustice, right? So black businesses are less likely to have uh, the same access to capital when they're funded. So they're already from the gate, 20 to 30%, sometimes even greater than that, uh, not funded at the same level, given that their expertise, their, their credit, all of their things are the same. They just automatically don't receive the same funding. And then they don't have the access to capital in terms of like uh, VC capital or different other um, fundings. Black women are 0.2% funded by VC money. Uh, and, and that, you, you know, point two, point two percent, point two. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and women in general, and that's a whole nother topic and a whole nother series uh, for uh, uh, Leslie and Mark to tackle. And so, um, but there's so many different things and nuances that have come to play over generations. And I think it's that having honest conversations like this in the series, making certain that um, that we are able to talk about it. We're comfortable with being uncomfortable and acknowledging that those differences actually exist and they're not made up. They're not um, a figment of somebody's imagination or a certain ethnic group just not being able to toe the line. Uh, they're, they're real adversity, adversities that are at play. So, it, what is like, what is the, I know this time we're going to make three particular suggestions of what people can do to kind of help with this whole world of, of securing economic justice. What is the first suggestion of specific actionable ideas of what people can do to move towards economic justice? I love the practicality of this, right? So we all get overwhelmed, economic justice sounds scary and what does that mean? And we don't quite know, but what we do know that for instance, if you live in a city that has a uh, 6% uh, black residents and you'd like to see more black residents, you do know that your personal spending habits might contribute to helping more black businesses stay there, thereby more black citizens and residents and your neighbors. So then you're able to make certain that um, if that is part of your value system, right, that uh, you're able to assist uh, in that manner. And so, go ahead. No, so like, what is the best way for people to find businesses to support? So uh, our organization uh, does a uh, has a healthy number of businesses in the area. There are a few others that do well as well. It's uh, Austin BC. C.org. That's austinbcc.org. And they can go on there and find a list of businesses. We also supply uh, certain news outlets and any, basically anyone who asks, you know, hey, can you send us a list of, and we curate lists that have uh, mental health uh, care providers was big early on in the pandemic. We knew that there was a need. We also knew that um, entrepreneurs may not have that cash, their cash flow might have stopped because everyone was hurting like we all were, right? And so we also put uh, our vendors and mental health care providers in touch with uh, the city because we knew that they had funding to make certain that uh, people had access to good mental health care during uh, the pandemic and crisis. Okay, um, so what about, what about your corporate dollars? You know, that to me is number two. For, 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 for those people who, who control corporate dollars, whether that's you hire a lawyer for your business or you hire an accountant or you're buying pencils, you know, um, how can you, what do you, what's the best way for businesses to find more vendors? 
So it's back to that intentionality. What do you want? What, what's your value system? What, how, how do you want to assist? It's not good enough to have a black screen in your Facebook page or wh whatnot. That's, that's simple. That's easy. Um, looking at where are you spending your money, being honest about that, looking at your supplier, div uh, supplier diversity uh, lists. Um, have you, what's your program like? When you know you have a cafeteria and you're staffing the the lemonade, have you considered looking at other vendors? And so, what I tell people, the easiest way to go about that is make certain that there's intentionality. Create those lists. Go to an organization like mine. Go to other organizations. You have to be proactive. You can't sit by and just think it's going to happen. You have to look at it. What I people have learned over time that, for instance, buying blood diamonds is not appropriate. They've learned and they, they acknowledge that they, they don't want that. Or child labor, for instance. Like, you don't want to support a company that supports uh, uh, children working in, in pools and un, uh, just not going to school. I, don't, I, I think now the next iteration of this discussion is how do you support and dismantle uh, systems that are just not just or fair? So I was thinking about this. So, for example, the people I know who are in business they have long-standing relationships with law firms, with their vendors. I mean, if people aren't willing to change, how do you go about and you say to that business, you know, um, we, I've been customer for a long time. What are you doing about to bring diversity into your workforce or into your vendor? I mean, it, how, how, do you, how do you say that to a business like so that, you're, that you're a customer of already? Yeah, there's a there's some great examples in Austin of some companies that are already doing that. So instead of putting their uh, their their black and I keep going back to the black uh, screen because that was just such an interesting thing to me. And I, I had a company in particular reach out to me that said, you know, Tim, we don't really know if the black square is what we need to do. We want to wait a moment and and find out what we what we can do. So one of their things was when they go into business with people or as they are in the process of business with them, they have a, a diversity statement. And it's a series of questions that they kind of ask them, like, tell us about this. Tell us um, how many, what's your d diversity hiring practice? Do you have a diversity statement? And they just went down, I think it was about 15 questions asking them. Be this was before, but you are, of course, talking about while you're already in the relationship. I just think, you know, Candor is king. I, I'm looking to make certain that I influence uh, my spending in this manner. Help me understand whatever the practice is, your hiring practice. Help me understand that. And, and we are looking for people that are responsible in this area as well. That's right. This is important to me. I'm your customer. We have a long-term relationship. Yeah. And I just want you to be aware that this is important to me. Absolutely. So, um, Okay, so the next thing that you and I talked about earlier was the third thing that we wanted to kind of cover was, you know, being intentional on how you spend your charitable dollars um, and asking people to really kind of pay attention to that. Um, and the reason that I, I find this so interesting is I was in a meeting about a year ago um, where Dr. Leonard Moore, who's like the VP of community engagement and a professor of history at UT, explained that there is this thought that white people will give to white charities that help communities of color, but not black charities that help communities of color. Can, can you comment on that? I can, sadly so I can. There is a disparity in funding, as in our businesses, there's also disparity in funding in our nonprofits. Um, we are often asked to create the same amount of deliverables um, as other organizations doing similar work, or I'm sorry, different amount of deliverables for a, other organizations that are doing similar work and they are um, granted more money in that same amount scope of work. And I said that clumsily, basically that when we are executing an amount of uh, restricted funds, basically, right? So those are funds, uh, cause I realized that I was using jargon a moment ago. Uh, those are funds that are attached to deliverables. You have to do certain things to, to get those. Some organizations don't have any restrictions. They're just able to, to get money and no one asks them any questions. No one says, we need you to do X, Y, Z. So 
uh, I've been trying to, I've been on this personal mission, mission trying to make certain that um, companies are understanding that when they give in that manner, they're creating disparity. You, it's that, that's not redlining, that's not 50 years ago. This is right now today when you don't give equitably or you don't believe in the mission for uh, nonprofits that are run by black leaders, that they're capable. Cause that's, that's really what you're saying. Even if you don't intend to, you're really saying that somehow we don't value the work that you do the same as some others. Um. I, I just found that whole concept really actually kind of astounding. Like for me, I always question, you know, I happen to think that Houston Tillotson and Austin is just an amazing place and every, you know, and everyone is giving to UT, but I, you know, I wonder, you know, I want more people to be thinking about more broadly for the community, also Houston Tillotson. And, you know, how do people think like when they're giving, you know, if I'm going to give to UT, I should also think about other universities that are serving different populations. Oh, absolutely. Other universities, other nonprofits, just really thinking about, in, in my family, what we do is a, a cycle of our charity, our charitable giving. So we'll have a couple of, of organizations that we decide to donate money to at the top of the year. And that's what we do for that year. And then we cycle a different. So we make certain that we, even in my home, that we're being diverse and intentional about our giving. Got it. Um, tell me about like black, black charities. Are they like black businesses and that they have unique challenges? Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Again, it's, it would start with the way that we're funded initially. We're underfunded when we, when we start, we're, we're continuously cash strapped. Um, again, I, I don't know. It, it sounds odd to say, because I know how hard and I know there's some amazing uh, black charities and charities run by black leaders, but the um, the reality is I can only, I, I don't know why would you not fund them the same? Like, why would you go in thinking that I shouldn't fund this? Like, what what is that thought process? How do you come to that conclusion that you should give like my chamber less than you would give another chamber? And so, and, and then on top of that, expect my chamber to, do a lot more work for for less money. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for people to understand that um, and a lot of opportunity for growth. So what happened in, in your world, like to donations and memberships after George Floyd? Was there a before and an after? And I mean, there's also, I mean, there's so much mixed up in this because you also of course had COVID. So yeah. it's trying hard to kind of separate this, but the before and the after George Floyd world I'm really interested in. I call it the perfect storm. Uh, interestingly enough, our uh, small business membership uh, increased, our membership increased. M businesses understood their, their need to, to engage your black chamber. They knew that we've been fighting for them for 40 decades. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, four decades, <laughs> 40 years. And so, um, so that happened, our corporate giving however, went down, it decreased. And we were kind of stunned by that. And what we figured out and what we were hearing is that they were forming new partnerships with, you know, brand new uh, organizations. So we weren't the, we weren't the new shiny toy. And I, I was experiencing, I was hearing that experience from some other organizations that had been doing this work for a long time. And so um, I like it when we have corporate uh, advocates that are inside that know the work that we do and that can say to their higher ups that, and not just us, but other organizations that they have been doing this work for a long time. We've never fully funded them. And then the aha moment goes up to their, their leaders that like, oh, we really haven't, you're right. And so, and that's, that's been very helpful. Um, um, okay, so if if there were so now we've we've come up with our three things. Our three things are be intentional in your personal spending, be intentional in your corporate spending, both in terms of what you spend and if you can't change who you spend with, how you talk to them. And then the third thing is in your charitable giving to give to organizations that are run both by people of color and that work on equity and sometimes a combination of the of both. Um, if there are one or two things that you want people to take away about economic injustice 
or what would that be? What, what, what do you think about? I think that people have more power than they realize. I think more power to shape the future that they wish for their children to inherit. Um, I think that starts with looking around you to understand that things might not, might not appear as having fresh eyes. I think that unfortunately COVID-19 happened, uh, but we get to look at things differently. We don't have to return exactly to the same way things always have, have been. We can, we can approach things differently and understand that everybody did not start off the, at the same line, right? We all didn't start off the same line. And some of us have had huge hurdles to, to overcome. So in, in kind of like my journey, um, my journey in understanding all of this, and I've always talked about how George Floyd kind of cracked the door open for a lot of people, you know, who were, who that was their aha moment. I mean, I've had aha moments and then, and I think people for are, are much more willing to look at this and, and this is kind of a painful process for a lot of people, right? And, and, and the way that I, I, I explain this to some of them is I, I'll say to them, you know, this country has made great strides, um, but often they come after periods of great reflection and introspection. And we are probably going through one of those times right now where we will end up better on the other side. So what does the other side look like? How is it different than it is now? So I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think we're, we're experiencing um, growing pains, right? And so um, we have to be vigilant though, right? Because in, the, in that experience, we can see some, some rollback and, uh, and history has taught us that that does occur. Um, I, the other side to me looks like um, we are able to see some economic parity. We're able to not have this looming, before the, the pandemic, we had this looming figure that by 2050, that black wealth would be net zero in this country. Net zero, Renee, like how is that even possible? Uh, and so um, it looks like that number is so wrong is what it looks like. And do you think we'll be able to tell by data? I mean, is that what is is that what it's going to be? I mean, is it going to be that that people talk have the same talks with their kids ab about what it's like to grow up, no matter your color? I mean, what is what is that? It, it, are those the metrics that we're going to be looking at? Oh, absolutely. We'll see that when we see the the black consumer uh, spend rival the black revenue generation. We'll be talking about that more that people will know, we will know about asset poverty and we'll see those numbers decrease, right? And so, um, and people will, I think as we evolve, we'll become more aware of that and understanding how to, to, to make things more fair and uh, make certain that um, our kids are saying, well, what was it like when that was this way? And so I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm very hopeful. And have you seen, like the, the, over the last four decades, what progress have you seen? I mean, and, you know, the things that you're fighting for. I mean, the thing that I've taken away from all of my studies is it just feels like everything is harder when, you know, if you, if you can't get loans and, and, you know, resumes are looked at differently depending on your name or, you know, and, depending on your neighborhood, you know, property values and all of those kinds, all of those kinds of things. Have, have you noticed subtle changes even since June, since George Floyd? I have, I've, I've had, I've noticed a more willingness to admit that things aren't always fair. I mean, just starting with that basic premise, you know, and, and I, and I, by that same token, I have seen pushback that things are fair, everything's fine, but I'm hopeful that more people are able uh, I think it's because we're all at home together, right? We're all, everybody's at yeah, home. We're all home. So we're able to focus on it. Like may, maybe we got it wrong. And so, and, um, and, or maybe I've never even thought about it to get it wrong in the first place, but now I'm focused on it. Now I can ask uh, some questions and kind of, kind of poke around. Um, so if, if you were me, like, what would you like me to be doing or my, you know, you know, like when I, I, I for me, I, I work on, I like have 
a gazillion conversations. I ask a lot of questions as I'm sure you've learned. Um, um, and being intentional with all of these things, is there anything, w one more step that I could be taking, you know, after all of these things? So I think we talked about personal spin, but we didn't talk about how we teach our children to do that. And I think that our children, you know, are just so amazing. And they just, and even now with a lot of the, the division, I still see them as very different than us. The, the, it's like the adults are having the crazy conversation and the kids are like, what are they talking about? I have no idea. Let's go play on our video game. And so, um, um, I think teaching them to make certain that they're intentional about their spending habits, I, I, I think is key as well. And now it is time for our question and answer session. Thank you guys all for letting us have that time where we, um, we, did the, we redid the taping. Um, and so now I'm gonna go ahead and move on to questions. Um, for people who are not leading businesses, but work in them, how do we advance economic justice? Can you repeat the... Um, okay, so for those people who are working in businesses, they, they're not the owners, but oh, yeah. are, you know, the team members, how do they advance economic justice? So what oftentimes are the small things uh, that you can start with change. So the, the office birthday party, where'd you buy your cake from? You know, so Austinites love to buy locally, right? So how, pen, dig a little deeper. How many ba bakers that you know that, that are black or and find a list and ask around. And again, it does require effort. It is these businesses have not gotten a lot of press. They don't have the money to be right in front of your uh, your screen when you're doing the search. So it's you you have to dig a little and you can go to um, um at our website, you can go to other places, you can type in a uh, Google, by the way, great corporate uh, uh, citizenship here. They are putting uh, flags. If you're a black business, they tag it. So it's even easier now. And so um, there, there's so many wonderful tools now. Okay, so this question is, is a little, I'm gonna see if I can get this. Can you speak to the parallel work of proactively supporting black businesses and communities and the work of white people recognizing and working through how white privilege and systemic racism has benefited them? So, so how I interpret that question is that the, the work has to be done simultaneously and um, having people in power, quite frankly, is to me how I interpret that question, come to the conclusion that they also have to be honest and make certain that they are, are doing their part because again, I, I, I maintain that none of us created these systems. Like we, we inher inherited them, but we all are responsible for changing them. So yeah, that's something that um, I always, when I was talking to you about this earlier, how people, this is a very uncomfortable place for a lot of people, Yeah. but you end up better on the other side. It's just better. having to work through it. It's, um, it's similar to your parents making you eat your vegetables. Like you don't want to do that, and it, but it, and it tastes gross, but you know that it's better for your health long-term. Yes, I would completely agree with that. <laughs> okay, so this is actually an interesting one. The percentage of people of color in Austin has dra dropped dramatically. How does that affect what happens in Austin? Well, it depends on from which perspective. What I say is it's similar to the affordability question for Austin and for other cities that have gone, you know, the way of the sword with this. Is that really the city that you want to live in where the black population continues to dwindle? The, the cultural uh, uh, aspect that we provide to it, that just diversity in general, like is, I, I believe clearly that diversity is a good thing. And so making certain that um, that this wonderful city that we've all come to know and love uh, is enjoyed by, uh, by black people, quite frankly, and that they understand that there's a great opportunity for uh, growth in, in, in businesses. Of course, I'm gonna default to that because that's, uh, that's what I focus on. Um, okay, so Austin City Council has specific targets for women-owned, minority-owned businesses. They give contracts to but do you think their targets are aggressive enough? Do you think by combining women-owned and minority-owned company dilutes the impact for both groups? That's a, a tough question. I think that, um, 
I think we we have some of the same challenges, but we're very different, right? And so I, I think there could be opportunity to um, expand some of the work for each group, of course. So, um, okay, so what sources should I look at to see the data about the ability for black people to get a loan, property values being lower, resumes being looked at differently, access to capital? What are like the best sources? I mean, well, you can go to Fred, you can go to the US census, you can go the economic census. You, there are so, if you want to know, I was watching uh, Blackish uh, this week and he, he's saying this song about, uh, you can Google it, you know? So, um, and I, I, I hope Google's listening. And so <laughs> I am- um, They are. There's, they, there's so <laughs> many, there's so many um, avenues that you can use. There's so many resources. Uh, you can go to our website, probably has some statistical data. Uh, we do presentations on it. Uh, there's so much information on it. it re there really is. I mean, today I was on the Brookings Institute site and there they talked about how the average white family has 10 times the wealth of the average black family. I mean, if you just type in any of those things, you will get valid sources for the differences and the data disparities. Um, um, so I, I, encourage, I encourage curiosity. I mean, Absolutely. I think that that's what's happened is the more curious I have become about this, the more my jaw drops. That's, that's kind of like this process that you go through and then you kind of go through an acceptance. Um, so now I have the opposite effect, Brene. Like sometimes I'm like crying in my hands, just like, oh, my work is just so hard. Like, what do I do? And then I remember I'm very privileged and blessed to do this work, right? Like I'm, I'm blessed. So it's, uh, and we're having this conversation. And I think about the collaboration that happened to make these, the series, the series occur. And, and that's amazing. To, that is what's different. That's what I've noticed. Renee, you asked me about that earlier. You, you've noticed in terms of the community coming together to put on a series like this and to work collectively? Correct. And then the, give people practicality. Um, dismantling racism is scary, right? What does that mean? What does that look like? But you do know how to tell your kids to, let's go buy, you know, from this baker. And it's not even, the kids don't even recognize what you're doing and, or whatever. I mean, so that you do know how to do that. You do know how to look at who are you giving to. You, you, you do know how to do that. Yeah, yes. Okay, do, do black owned businesses in surrounding counties belong to the Austin Black Chamber or do they have a local chapter? What is the best way in small communities to find out who our black owned businesses are? So we have a five county reach. So um, we are the second largest chamber, uh, black chamber in Texas. Uh, and that's so funny to me because we have such a small black population, but we, we happen to be the, the second largest uh, chamber in Texas, black chamber in Texas. Uh, so we welcome you find out about us. We, we have the five county, that's Travis, uh, Hayes, Caldwell, Williamson and Burnett. Got it. And why, why do you have the second largest, even though we have so much of a smaller black community in Austin? So I'm, I'm trying to think of the answer where we don't sound braggadocious, right? Um, so- um, You're just so I, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's that uh, the community supports for one. I also think that uh, we have the benefit of having the tech community here. Yeah. And I think Austin is just, prosperous in general and entrepreneurs, even our black entrepreneurs in the retail trade sectors, we out earn um, uh, others in different, in larger cities and markets three to one. So yeah. Um, yeah, so there is good news too, right? But it's just not moving fast enough and there's still such huge disparity. Yes, and Okay, so what are the challenges the Hispanic community faces with regard to economic justice and are they different? Um, I, I don't suppose to speak for the Hispanic community. I will tell you what my, my idea of that is. I, they have similar challenges to us. Uh, we often work quite frankly with the, uh, the Hispanic chamber here locally. Uh, we have a really great working relationship because we do have some of the similar uh, challenges they have uh, access to capital issues. Uh, they, they experience racism um, 
and uh, economic racism. And um, so those are some, I hope I answered that as, as best I could. Um, they experience some of the same challenges that we do. Okay. So this is an actually pretty interesting question because this talks about not just like businesses, but, but workers, right? How should we approach the matter of tech giants such as Amazon who may employ a diverse workforce on one hand, but then exploit communities of color on the other? I'm thinking of way these organizations squeeze out local business competition and stifle wage growth. Wow. That is a, that's an entire like hour long, uh, great Another question. series. Yeah, Another series. Great, <laughs> great question. I, I think it's just back to the uh, corporate social responsibility and just, I mean, I, I see corporations as, as well, and legally, they're uh, declared as human beings, right? And so they have the rights of, of humans. And so um, just making certain that you hold their feet to the fire uh, and, and keeping them honest. And I think most people, and I also believe most corporations actually do want to do the right thing. Some of them are lost on just how. And not everybody. Some people do not. I mean, that's true. But I don't tend to, to focus on that. What is the group? I know your kind of sphere is business. What is the group you most worry about in your community? Uh, can you, in what terms, is my community specifically or an outside group and the damage that they could cause to my community? No, no, no. I'm more thinking about um, in terms of like economic justice, who are, I mean, we're speaking about black, about, about black business, but I'm, I'm talking about more, you know, yeah. other, other, other areas um, I, in, in terms of like wage growth or in terms of things like that, what, what I, areas do you see are that concern you or that you'd like to see more growth in? I mean, I probably 50, but there's a lot. Um, I, my first one, I have two. Uh, my first one would be uh, health disparities. I, I want that just severely worked on. Um, and there are some wonderful groups here in town that are doing some excellent work. And the, the pandemic highlighted how grave those disparities, which a lot of us that are already doing this work already knew. Um, that's my first one. My second one would be in education. Uh, and uh, injustice for for our youth in particular, and I and I, I I wormed my way to talk about it in the video of the the baby this week that went viral, um, the nine year old who was uh, handcuffed and pepper sprayed, and my mind just keeps. And part of it's because I have an eight year old, and so and I just can't imagine having uh, a child be um, uh, in that. So I would love to see attainment uh, and. And, and I, even when I say that, I don't really like it because that puts the onus on the children. And I don't think it's the children, it's the systems. Right. So, and making certain that the systems uh, educate them properly and address their needs. So. Got it. So, um, so it's, it's again, it's back to that theme that everything is involved, health, education, you know, all of these issues end up feeding the economic justice, the issues of economic justice. Absolutely. Um, what do you think Austin does well as a city and what can it improve on? Um, I love these questions. <laughs> so um, I think Austin has, a. at the end of the day, I really do believe Austin has a good heart. I believe that, you know, we are a city that could have an, a task force on institutional racism, like talk about a small task to, to, to handle. Um, we also ha get to come together and have conversations like this from a cross sector of people, right? So I think that that's the part that we do really well. I think some of what we could work on is making people feel welcome by that same token that we, I think sometimes we do this kind of do-gooder do and we pat ourselves on the back and then we forgot um, um, that there's another side. And I'll give you uh, an example. Please, that would be Black, great. Black Lives Matter signs in my, in my neighborhood. And I, I make jokes to myself that Black Lives Matter as long as I'm not your neighbor walking in the street and you forget to wave at me. And so as I wave back, so, do they matter or, you know, so um, make certain that we're not invisible, that we're not, we're here. And, you know, uh, I, I have another tiny story with an example. I, uh, sweet lady, sweet lady was um, at a birthday party and, 
and our kids go to school and there were a group of black moms that were over here. And then she came and she was the only white mom and she stayed over playing with her kids. And I thought, well, come, come over. Like we, you know, just, and she didn't know some of the black moms, but she knew two of the black moms. So I should have done a better job myself of making certain that she was welcome and it's okay. And so um, just making people feel welcome. Okay, next, another small topic, you ready? Okay. Um, okay, what can we do to address affordable housing for people of color? So there's another been much- series, Another series. But- another series, but I yes. can do land trust, a, a great way to look at it. Um, we also can, and recently, uh, and I spoke about the collaboration and partnership that I have with some of my other colleagues. We've been talking about in the recruiting cycle, back to that corporate citizenship. What are, how are we helping companies that come here understand their responsibility to, to helping us maintain an affordable housing um, um, option? And so I, I think there, there are some things that can be done there. Got it, got it. Um, okay, where do you see the future what, what, what do you see the future is for African-Americans in Austin and in what way can leaders attract more to feel comfortable and move to and live in Austin? Oh, I say it starts with recruiting. I, I remember a, a tech uh, partner that said, well, we just can't find black engineers. And I was like, well, are you recruiting at Prairie View? And they were like, well, no. And I was like, it's right down the street. And, you know, about, I don't know, it's a high percentage. I, will, I won't quote it because I don't know it anymore. Uh, but a high percentage of black engineers come from Prairie View. So you've got to go over there if you want that. So that's one thing, it starts with recruiting. The other thing is uh, making certain that um, they're they're hiring uh, black people. And then the, the biggest thing I have, and I know it sounds so small, is the welcome factor. I hear from black professionals and leaders when they move here, they do not feel welcomed. They, they feel isolated. And how, so, do you, how do we how do we change that as a city? I mean, how how do you do that? I think it starts with individuals. I think it's when you know you knock on your and, neighbor, you knock on your neighbor's door. Welcome, yeah, to you Austin. knock on your neighbor's door. Hi, welcome, welcome to Austin. I think it's when you see uh, you make an effort to say hello and and get to to know people. So. Got it. Um, okay, what are some projects that the Black Chamber is working on, and how can we be involved? Oh. That's like a, that, that is a softball. <laughs> <laughs> we are currently working on a few accelerators. One that I'm super excited about is uh, our, uh, and I've, I've been seeing a little bit of the chat. I, I can't focus on it, but I will see it pop up. And I, I didn't realize how much I speak in acronyms, uh, but a CPG accelerator, and that's Consumer Packaged Goods Accelerator. So again, we, we found in our research that the, uh, the black consumer spend is exorbitantly high as opposed to the revenue generation in the in those goods so we want to make certain that we equip companies with the ability to scale up i'm so excited about this um so that's one we are um in the process right now of uh, finishing our planning on our black elected officials event that we've done for like 15 years and and i love that event because we aim to make certain that people have access to their elected officials. And so, and that they get to know them and see and kind of, and that's one of my favorite events and that's grown over years, but we're in COVID times and it's a little different. My other uh, event that we do is Taste of Black Austin, which is so much fun. And it's multicultural and it's these wonderful chefs and people did not know that we had as many uh, chefs providing uh, high, and cuisine here in Austin. They were like kind of these hidden figures amongst us. And uh, and one that I'm ex- particularly uh, proud of is over at Emmer and Rye, uh, uh, Tavo is just does amazing food. And so in uh, beautiful atmosphere, you know, when we are all able to, to dine inside again or uh, feel comfortable at least. So um, th- those are the things that excite me right now for us. And, and we're really going to focus on women. I, I am obsessed. I, I told Renee earlier, I am obsessed with what's happening to women in terms of um, the retreat from, from the working world in business because of COVID-19 and the effect that it's had on them. And our last recession, we saw us really gain. And I really 
want to see if we can fight some of the damage that might that's being done and making certain that we can help those women kind of uh, keep their businesses, scale their businesses up. Like how can we help them really grow and provide for their families? Okay. Um, next, yeah. how can Austin resist the racial bias and injustice in the financial credit system, especially around housing and life needs? Wow. That is a, that's a tiny, one. that's a series. Yeah, yeah, there all are. <laughs> There's like no easy questions here. Um, and But I love it. I really do. Because that means we're all thinking, right? And we're all working on it. Um, I One of the things that's disturbing is about the values of a, a Black person's home when it's uh, even next door to in a, in a white neighborhood. And when they go to sell their home, we, we all know that we've got to eradicate every trace of you being Black when you're showing your house, when you're listing. So I, I just think it's a mind shift is one thing. I think also institutions holding them accountable again, uh, making certain that they are, are adhering to the law and the fair lending practices that, so the laws exist, but it's a, are you turning a blind eye and are you accidental or accidentally uh, having practices and policies in place that would continue to perpetuate that disparity? Okay, hold on. I'm going to just, I want to go back to yeah. one thing you just said. So when people sell their house, what does it mean eradicate all, all way? Oh, all your photos. You do that anyway, right? But right. when you're black, you know, to hide like per, perhaps your hair care products, you know, you hide everything to make certain that the buyers do not know that you're black because they will not pay the same value for your house as and they that's, would. And that's been proven. Oh yeah, that's also proven. That is also, there was an expose that just recently was done. You can Google that and you can find uh, figures in the study and the research. And, I, and if I had the name of the research, I, I would call it off, but it is easy I think to find. This, this is the thing that I'm talking about. It's those little things that keep adding up and adding up and adding up, you know? And if, when people get loans, the loans are more expensive. And then when you go to sell your house, you have to hide yourself, you know, so that you don't get a lower price. I mean, it's just... It's just, um, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's, ex <laughs> it's, ex it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Okay. We have one more and then I think okay. we're done. Okay. So right. we'll give you break in a minute. What groups are helping, um, with health disparities? I would love to get involved. That's what, that's what, um, so there, there is a, a brand new group, uh, Dawa. That's one of my, my heart strings and what do they do. Oh, I'm sorry. It's D-A-W-A again with now. And I can't remember the exact uh, what DAWA means, but um, they help uh, in particular black artists mm -hmm. uh, with mental health care and, and immediate assistance for their, their needs. Like if their light bill is being turned off or whatever. And I think right now a lot of people have seen some reprieve, but they help them with immediate needs and access. Um, that that's one. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the black mamas collective and I believe they might've changed their name. Um, but uh, they, and if, even if you Google black mamas collective, they'll, the, the new name will come up. Uh, they are one that I like. Uh, it's not necessarily health related, but the work that Mimi Styles is doing with Measure Austin, She's she amazing. goes, yeah, it's amazing. And so she talks about the adultification of little girls, black girls. So to me, that still is tied to what I'm talking about, because my second part was what's going on with the children and the education. So that that is one. Um, there's so many. Um, I'm trying to think who else that does incredible work. We have a list of some of our partners again on our website. And if it's not exhaustive, I'll make certain by uh, next week that we have more that are there so people can make certain that they're able to um, to find the things that they need. And then if uh, people want to email us also, we can certainly uh, list uh, send over a list of recommendations. Okay. Well, thank you, Tam. I, I always yeah. find your insights to be incredibly illuminating and helpful. And I want to thank everyone for joining us in these important discussions and thank our supporters, the incredible team at Sanders Wingo, the LBJ Foundation, and their incredible staff, and Austin PBS. I also want to thank our community partners, of which there are too many to list, but be sure to look. Um, 
Now, you know the saying that the youth are our future. Join us next week at the same time for a conversation about the future, about how the next generation is fighting for racial justice and what we can all learn from listening to the voices of the young. Our guests and moderator are all from Creative Action. The guests are Don Burnside, the Senior Director of Racial Equity, Social Justice and Social Justice, Natalie Goodnow, School-Based Director, and students Louisa Najjar and Mickey Johnson. They will be interviewed by Karen Lachelle, who's the executive director. Thank you all and have a nice evening. Thank you.